In Psalm 31, we read the words, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and my body as well. It is for me one of the beautiful examples found in the psalm of someone being brutally honest. God does not desire for us to put up some facade. God desires to bring all of who we are into a relationship, no matter if it is distress or grief or sadness. God says, bring it to me. Let us be in relationship. And the psalm offers us a model of just that. This morning, as we begin our time together, for just another Sunday, we're going to do a little hymn fest. So I invite you to sing out strong. I'm guessing you're going to know all three of these hymns. Let us join our voices.
Let us join together in our call to worship. Turn to the Lord who loves us. We love the Lord our God, for it is God who gives us the first It is God who loves through difficult and complicated times. A love that will lead and guide us to healing. Come, let us stand and sing together. Let us pray together. You are the wonderful counselor and mighty God, and we turn to you this morning because life is rarely easy. The moment our path feels smooth and the journey feels effortless, we find ourselves tossed into situations where answers are not readily available, nor are they simple. May your abiding spirit, O loving Lord, provide for each of us both encouragement and strength along the way. May we feel open to expressing our emotions, grieving difficult losses, and walking the often complicated journey toward healing, doing so in the knowledge that we are never alone. Amen. Good morning, sisters and brothers in Christ. Welcome to this wonderful congregation, Cypress Creek Christian Church. 
We are so happy that all are here this day and a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us the first time. We hope that you've been made to feel welcome. And if you are here for the first time, we have a special gift for you, a blue bag that you will find at, at the Welcome Center in the Narthex. And we'd love to share that bag with you. It's full of information along with a few goodies. We hope you've taken a moment uh, in your worship bulletin to note the blue uh, card. We hope that you've spent a few moments uh, sharing your information, but uh, particularly taking the opportunity to share with us your joys and your concerns on the prayer side of the card. We take seriously the opportunity to join you in prayer for it connects us and connects all of us to our loving God. You will have an opportunity to place those blue cards in the offering plates later on in the worship service. So please take a moment to do that. And without further ado, let's take a moment to move around and greet each other in the spirit of Christian love and acceptance. Good morning, I'm Judy Boyder. Um, I'm going to introduce the soloist for today. Um, this is Emily Sun, a student of mine. She just graduated from Klein High School and will be attending UT Austin in the fall to major in speech language pathology. Emily has been studying voice with me um, over the last few years and just recently sang on a music tour in Austria she sang Ave Verum Corpus, which she will be singing today, and several other pieces, and with a choir as well in Innsbruck, Salzburg, and Vienna, um, and just had a wonderful tour, and her mother was there with her. Um, they sang together, as a matter of fact, in the choir. Um, Ave Verum Corpus is a short Eucharistic hymn that has been set to music by various composers. It dates from the 14th century. This setting is, um, the text was composed by, uh, well, of the text, was composed by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart in June of 1791. Uh, it's gonna be sung in Latin. It commemorates Christ's redemptive sac sacrifice and especially focuses on the great symbol of baptism. The translation, hail true body born of the Virgin Mary who has truly suffered and was sacrificed on the cross for mankind, whose side was pierced whence flowed water and blood, be for us a foretaste of heaven during our final trial. Miss Emily Sun.
I want to thank Emily for that gift of grace this morning. I love that Eucharist hymn in the last line that talks about a foretaste. The idea being that in worship, the different components of worship should be a foretaste of the kingdom of God and should teach us or train us so that in our living beyond these walls, we are a foretaste to others of the kingdom of God. It's a magnificent, magnificent piece. As some of you, many of you know, I was not here last Sunday. I was at the General Assembly of our denomination, along with 12 other folks from Cypress Creek. We had a wonderfully exhausting time. Um, Among the folks that went were seven of our youth, and I thought it was all summed up very well that on the last morning I went over to Uh, make sure they got on the van that got them to the airport, and they were all in the lobby, a couple of them laying on the floor, and I asked, how was it? And all I got back were these glazed over looks. They were exhausted, but they had a marvelous experience. Um, Six worship services, so many small group experiences, workshops, uh, youth outreach opportunities, and they did it all, along with about 4,200 other folks from our tradition uh, across the church, United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, and uh, representatives from around the globe as well. One of the things I loved was one of our young people going over to the overseas ministry booth and meeting one of our missionaries that was back on leave and just having that conversation about what he is doing. Well, this morning, we are going to begin a conversation looking at 2 Samuel, a book out of the Hebrew Scriptures, or what we know as the Old Testament, focusing on some of the stories of David. Now, I think most of us know some of the big stories of David, but there are these other stories that I think are quite relevant for us today. And the first passage comes, again, from 2 Samuel, the first chapter. I'll be reading the first 12 verses. I invite you to now hear these words. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. On the third day, a man came from Saul's camp. His clothes were torn and dirt on his head. When he came to David, he fell down to the ground and paid homage. David said to the man, where have you come from? He said to David, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. David said to him, How did things go? Tell me. He answered, the army fled from the battle, but also many of the army fell and died. And Saul and his son Jonathan also died. Then David asked the young man who was reporting to him, how do you know that Saul and the son Jonathan have died? The young man reporting to him said, I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear while the chariots and horsemen drew close to him. When he looked behind, he saw me and called to me. I answered, Here, sir. And he said to me, Who are you? And I answered, I am an Amalekite. He said to me, Come, stand over me and kill me. For convulsions have seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood over him and killed him, for I knew that he could not live after he had fallen. I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm, and I have brought them here to my Lord. Then David took a hold of his clothes and tore them, and all the men who were with him did the same. 
They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. May our God bless not only our hearing, our receiving, but our responding to these words of Scripture. Let us go to God in prayer. Open for us these words, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Guide. Open for us your message of redemptive grace that desires to see each of us healthy and whole. Open for us the pathway by which we must travel to find this holy and blessed destination. Amen. When I entered the room, she looked up and she said to me, I believe those who wrote the textbooks on grief in fact, never experienced grief themselves. She says the way they describe it, it is some orderly process. But the only process I can describe it as, and I love what she said. She said, it is like making gumbo without a recipe. Trial and error, errors and trial. The woman who spoke those words was in the hospital visiting her stepfather, the man that her mother had married late in life, Though now her mother was deceased, and this man that she was visiting, her stepfather, she was the only one who really knew him to come and see him. But it's important to note that their relationship was complicated. What I mean by that is that this man had a rather complicated past. And the choices that he had made impacted all the relationships he had. She later said to me, when they pronounced him dead, I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to feel. And then somewhat confessionally, she said to me, the only thing that came to my mind was Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy standing in Munchkinville, hearing the Munchkins sing, ding dong, the witch is dead. It was complicated. And what, it made, it, what made it more complicated is, is that she said, in that moment, a sudden wave of sadness came over her. It caught her off guard. Grief 
is complicated. Now, we tend to associate it with that emotional release that one feels when a loved one has died. We tend to think of it as the internal process that moves us to a new normal in light of a death. Grief is healthy. It's necessary. But what happens when the relationship is complicated? Maybe we didn't really like the individual. Maybe there was an uncomfortable or unhealthy relationship there. Maybe there had been an abusive relationship there. Grief suddenly doesn't feel as if it is the proper response. And yet there's still emotion there. Surprisingly, there might be sadness or frustration or anger and And what people often think is that this person or this situation is not grief worthy. Is not grief worthy. For David in our story this morning, he must have had a a mixed bag of emotions upon hearing that Saul and Jonathan were dead. Now, Jonathan was one that David loved. In fact, Scripture says that David loved Jonathan as much as he loved his own soul. But David's relationship with Saul was more complicated. When David killed the giant Goliath, suddenly his fame went through the roof while Saul's plummeted. And Saul was not happy with this. In fact, he became very jealous, an irrational jealousy that eventually sought to kill David. Yet David maintained this strange loyalty towards Saul in the mix of it all, maybe out of respect for his friend Jonathan, it would have made complete sense had David stood back from that situation and said, this man, this circumstance is not grief worthy. But that's not what happened. Scripture says that David and his companions, they mourned and wept and fasted for Saul and his son, Jonathan. I want to suggest this morning that most relationships are more complicated than we would like to admit. The feelings that we experience especially around someone's death, do not necessarily fit the textbook definition of grief. It feels sometimes like a confusing maze, uncharted territory, not knowing, do I turn left, do I turn right, which is the right way to go. I've been thinking about this a lot lately in regard to someone who has not died, but his reputation has died. That person is Bill Cosby. Like many of you, I grew up with Bill Cosby. I found him to be this ideal father figure, a respected voice, a wonderful comedian, and then suddenly things changed. And I know he has not been convicted in a courtroom, and yet this beloved figure and his story and his life have been tainted. And yet that word I don't think quite describes the way I feel about this situation. Part of me just wants to dismiss him. 
Part of me wants to forget about it or just simply turn off those memories, but it's more complicated than that. I was with a group of people just over a week ago, and we were talking about this situation, uh, I mean, another situation, and suddenly a a funny antidote came to mind, and I kind of threw it into the conversation, and I was about halfway through it when I came to a sudden screeching halt and realized that it was a funny antidote that Bill Cosby had shared. And suddenly I found myself apologizing for sharing it because it no longer felt funny in regard to everything that has happened. It's not a physical death, but it is a death, a betrayal, a feeling of that I'm lost. And yet I want to say it doesn't feel grief worthy. It's complicated. The process, the emotional maze that we find ourselves on. I use that word maze, but a couple months ago, when I first started thinking about this sermon, I'm praying about it, I realized that we should not view grief as a maze, as this thing with tall walls where we come to intersections and we've got to choose left or right and one way is right and one way is wrong and that in fact it should be you it should be viewed as a labyrinth a labyrinth is different than a maze a labyrinth is a spiritual practice it is a pathway that really only has one path there's no choices to be made except the choice to begin And there may be curves along the way in a labyrinth, but the path continually moves inward until you find yourself at the center. It is supposed to be an embodiment of the faith journey, of us going deeper into the center and discovering God anew. And then once you've reached the center of a labyrinth, the idea is that you turn back around And you go out the same way you came, and yet because you were willing to make the journey in the first place, you are now a different person as you go out of the labyrinth. What David's story helped me to realize is that our relationships are complicated. And there are times when around a death, whether a physical or an emotional death, it feels as if that person or that situation is not grief worthy. But that's really, in my opinion, not what we should be asking. We should not be asking, is that person, is that situation grief worthy? What we need to be asking is, are we worthy? Is our spiritual, emotional, and physical lives, and yes, grief impacts us in a very physical way, are they worthy of healing? I think part of what complicates it is that we believe if we give it too much energy, if we give this person or this situation that has harmed us or caused problems, if we are too intentional that somehow we are validating what that person did, that we are somehow legitimizing it. But grief and the deliberate process of moving through it is not about giving validation. It is more about opening ourselves to God and allowing God to bring the healing that we need. John Howard Yoder was, in my opinion, one of the greatest theological voices of the last hundred years. My master's thesis referenced a number of the books this Mennonite philosopher and theologian wrote. I loved how he challenged me in his writings how he expanded my understanding of grace and compassion and discipleship. 
I, I was so impressed by him. He served a Mennonite seminary in northern Indiana until he became a professor at Notre Dame for 30 years until his death in 1997. If there were trading cards for theologians, I would have wanted his card. Had he had a rookie card, I would have paid big money for his rookie card. But recently, it came to light that John Yoder had sexually manipulated and abused many of his female students. In fact, there are hundreds of complaints against him. I felt such anger, such betrayal. It didn't match up at all to his writings, and suddenly it felt like he was a fraud, and I wanted to erase his life witness from my memory. But it's complicated. A week after hearing that news, I was at a spiritual retreat center, and they had a labyrinth, a wonderful stone labyrinth, and I was walking it walking the journey towards the center of the labyrinth. And as I made my way there, I heard the voice of God. It wasn't an audible voice. It was that divine whisper that speaks to your spirit. And what it said to me was, it's not about whether this person is grief-worthy or not. It's about whether you, Bruce are worthy of my healing. For David, he presents for us this wonderful model of somebody being in a very complicated relationship and yet recognizing that the situation was grief worthy, not because of Saul, but because of who David was in the recognition that God wanted him to be whole. That David's spiritual, emotional, and physical life was worthy of the process of grieving. And the same is true for you and for me. Yes, relationships can be complicated and unhealthy, and they may not fit the textbook understanding of grief. But it's not a maze, or at least it shouldn't be. It should be a labyrinth by which we walk with God towards the center, where we find God on a deeper level and then are able to walk back that path as different people because we were willing to make the journey in the first place. Whether it was someone who hurt you, or someone who should have been there for you but was not, someone who disappointed you, or someone whose actions were simply complicated. The question is not whether or not that person or that situation are grief-worthy. The question before us this morning is, are we worthy of God's grace to heal our lives? And the answer is yes. And it's complicated. And yet we take God by the hand and God walks with us, not through a maze where we might go the wrong way, but through a labyrinth that has only one path, yeah, some curves, but journeying towards the center where we are once again affirmed as people of value in the eyes of God, people who are worthy of God's healing. It's complicated sometimes. But just because it's complicated doesn't mean it's not grief worthy, because it is. And God has gifted us with a process by which we can heal. I invite you now to join your voices in song. As we sing together hymn number 588, Have Thy Own Way, Lord.
Let us quiet our minds and our spirits and go before our God in a time of prayer. In Christ Jesus, we have learned that we are worthy. We are of value. We are treasured by you, Lord God. And this morning, as we begin to think about the relationships we have, we recognize that there are some relationships that might be a bit more complicated than we had previously admitted. Where injury has occurred, where we have felt betrayed or disillusioned or lost, we are not called to bury it or to forget it, because we can't. And yet your Spirit invites us to name it, to recognize the importance of grief. And in our recognition, we're not giving credence to what was done in the sense that we are approving it or are validating it. We are simply recognizing that we are, in your eyes, Lord, people of value. And you want nothing more than for us to know wholeness. Encourage us. Invite us to be intentional, to seek out the support of a friend, a therapist, to seek you, the marvelous counselor, for you desire above all things to see us to return to health. Speak to us, Lord God. Remind us that we are of value and that our life situations are grief worthy. This morning, here at Cypress Creek Christian Church, as we gather for worship, we do so alongside Christians around the globe. We acknowledge the hurt and suffering of countless individuals, yet you know them. Their numbers are not beyond your capacity to count. Among those numbers, there are those within our own community. We pray for Diane and Melissa. We lift before you John, Jan, Linnell, Claude, L.B., Jerry, Patty, Don, Sharon, Sarah, and Ken. May your spirit of grace meet each of them, providing them strength and healing as they journey forward. And where there are difficulties and people feel unworthy, allow your spirit to speak and allow your spirit to speak through us so that we can clearly announce to our sisters and brothers and all the world that you created us, O Lord, and you declared us to be good. We offer these words of prayer in the name of Jesus who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our time every week around the communion table is a good reminder that we are people of value in the eyes of God. Every Sunday an invitation is extended, an invitation that is clear that there is no one outside of the love of God. We are all welcomed here, not by our own doing, but by the grace of God that 
says we are people of value. And God desires for us to find healing and wholeness. And one of the best places to start is here at the table, in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. Let us prepare ourselves now for communion. Come, come to the table. Come to the table of peace and love. Do not let the chaos or the complications or the complexities or the confusion of life keep you from coming to the table. In fact, bring them all along. Bring all of that with you and allow God's embrace to cover you, that you might experience the depth of God's love for you and continue the journey of healing. Let us pray. If God is with us, who can stand against us? I pray, Heavenly Father, as a Christian and part of the Christian community, that we can have that faith when we go out into society, that we would be the Christians that you would have us to be. I know sometimes, Father, it seems like being a Christian is a difficult task, but you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to show us how to live. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we go out into the communities and our circles, that we will be compassionate Christians, that we will not beat down those that we think are unbelievers, but rather we will have compassion on them and mercy on them and try to give them understanding and teach them the word as you have taught us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless those that are low in spirit sometimes, that you will lift them up, those who are grieving, that you will comfort them. Heavenly Father, we prepare for communion, where Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. As we come to this table, I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will get in the mindset that Jesus gave his life that we might live. As we take of this loaf, which is his body that was broken for us, and as we drink of this cup, which is the New Testament in his shedded blood, that as often as we take of these elements, we will do so in remembrance of him until he come again. It is in Christ Jesus' name that I ask these and all blessings. Amen. Here at Cypress Creek Christian Church, we invite everyone to come forward to partake of this holy meal. You will be offered a piece of bread. You may dip it in the cup of fruit juice and then partake of the elements. If you are unable to come forward, please raise your hand and we will have 
this wonderful meal brought to you. This is also an opportunity as you come forward to bring your blue cards along with your tithes and offerings and place them in the offering plates located at the side of the chancel. And be reminded as always that all who are here this day are invited to this table. It is the Lord's table and only the Lord's table. We are all invited guests. As we continue to prepare for this wonderful time together, we remember those moments that night when Jesus was betrayed, when he and his disciples gathered together in an upper room that had been prepared for them. They ate that last meal together when Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And then he took a cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is to be shed on the behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
please pray with me. God, our unshakable foundation, so much in our lives is a constant state of change, the new becoming old so quickly. Sometimes we find ourselves immersed in grief with the loss of people we love. We need to be reminded Christ is always with us and we are never alone. As we offer our gifts to you, remind us that your love and the compassion, humility, hunger for justice that Christ taught us as disciples are constants. Help us to be open to new things, new ideas, and new ways to serve you, keeping Christ as our cornerstone. In his name we pray, amen. This is a special time in our service that we reserve to invite people to join us. If you are visiting and you have had a call on your heart and would like to become a part of this faith community, during our next hymn, you can either come forward or meet me at the back or one of the other pastoral staff or elders. We would love to talk to you and get to know you and share about our wonderful church with you. So let us lift our voices. Okay, in case you hadn't noticed, Bruce exited the building. And the, the announcements are going to tell you why. A lot of our young people are on their way to camp. So Bruce has left to take Zach to camp. So that's why I'm up here today. So let's keep all of our youth in prayer, our young people. Um, our youth group, the Cairo and CYF, are having a swim party today at Tom and Marion Reed's. We thank you, Tom for allowing our kiddos to come over there. And Wednesday, I invite you all to come and hear Dr. Mark Witten speaking on critical Christian thinking about homosexuality and gay rights at 6.30. This will be a five-week series, and if you can't make all of them, that's fine. Each week is going to be self-contained, so we invite you to come when you're able. There is a sign-up outside so that we know how many tables and chairs to have. Um, available and also we're ordering pizza so we know if you're going to be there to eat. Let's see, the men's regional retreat is September 18th through the 20th. The early bird deadline is coming up the end of this month. There are some scholarships available. Bruce is going to be going, so I invite all you men to think about going. If it's your first time, I'm told that you get a $50 off coupon. So think about going. Let's join hands and say a word of prayer. Father God, we are so grateful for all that you do for us. We are worthy, and we know that by, by your word. 
It's complicated, Lord. Sometimes we have a hard time understanding and knowing that you walk beside us every step of every day. Be with us, Lord, as we go from this place. Let your light shine through us in everyone we meet. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.